Welcome to SHOT Show 2018. We're broadcasting live from the Brownells booth. I'm Steve Ostrom, and with me I have a very special special guest today, Larry Vickers. Larry, thanks for coming by. It's Got good it, to brother. see you. I enjoyed doing this last year. So. We had a great time. Tony hit me up to do it again this year. I said absolutely. It's been quite a year. Yes, it has. Uh, you've been very busy. Yeah. Training, uh, weapons design, uh, writing books, you yep. name it. Yep. The book thing is the thing that, uh, honestly, has kind of taken me by surprise. Um, my good buddy Ken Hackathorn, some of you might know the story already, approached me and said, hey, you ought to look at doing some coffee table books. I said, you know, I've thought about doing that, but I don't, I don't have a guy to take the photos. I don't have an editor. I need somebody to help. It is quite a process. And, and out of the blue, uh, James Rupley, a guy from Nashville, contacted me and said, have you ever thought about doing this? And I said, you know, I have. Why don't you come pay me a visit? And then things took off from there. We did the 1911 book, which has sold. That is been a huge success. That's a great book. And that really launched the whole line. Yeah. The latest one's World War II German Small Arms. The guys who follow my social media know what's coming up next. We have AK Volume 1. That was inevitable. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. actually the most anticipated one so far. We've been teasing a few photos here and there on social media about various AKs we have for the book and we're going to end up it's going to be ended up being probably a two or three volumes. That's set. going to be a huge deal. Um, first one will be out. We're looking at Christmas 2018. Okay. AK 2018. Well, the current one is the World War II weapons, yeah, World right? World War II German Small Arms Volume 1. We're also working on a Volume 2. Yeah. And that's an area I'm very interested in yeah, absolutely. personally. You know, obviously a horrific time in history yes. but when you look at it from a historical perspective in the small arms development um, it was something that needed to be covered it was something that, that um, required some serious focus on it to kind of right. to delve into a wide variety of small arms that germany you know fielded during world war ii very fascinating area and as you know a lot of collectors yes a lot of people collect world war ii german small arms it's like layers of an onion very serious collecting going on. Big there. time, big money. And a lot of technology that we still will live with today. Absolutely. Uh, a lot of new concepts got tested out in that war, and we still see them all around us. Uh, absolutely. From 1939 to 1945, you saw the greatest advancement in military small arms in history. And I'm sure ever in history, we'll never see yeah. that again. Um, assault rifle, general purpose machine. The whole gun. concept of that assault absolutely. rifle. Absolutely. Until then, everybody had been shooting 30 odd six or 8 by 57 at each other, or 9 millimeter or 45. The M1 carbine came along, but still, it wasn't quite there. And then the 8 millimeter quartz came. And the, the Soviets loved that so much. Absolutely, heavily. I, big believer personally that that the AK was heavily influenced by the Sturm Gewehr. Yes, definitely. Propaganda, but it's kind of common sense. You know, you got to kind of take a step back and get around the propaganda. And I'm, I'm a big believer that they were heavily influenced by that gun. With all the firepower, you know, that was unheard of for then. How could you not be, though? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, double action, single action service pistols mm -hmm. like the M9 Beretta, of course. Right. P226. Right. Go back to the P38 of World That's War II. That's right. Lockup system for the Beretta, Absolutely. same thing. So, yeah, big era. I was very passionate about doing that book and really bringing a lot of stuff to the table for people. To, and we've gotten great feedback on it. People love it. I was absolutely delighted to learn that you had a co-writer on this project. Oh, yeah, Ian. Ian, Ian uh, from Forgotten Weapons. Yes. If you're not familiar with Forgotten Weapons, check out that channel. It is wonderful for yeah, the history we, buff. We hit it off. It was, it, was a, it was a great partnership. He's going to be helping us moving forward. He has a unique ability to tap into older stuff that a lot of people don't. As That's you know, right. we were That's talking right. about before we started filming, Ian, you know, he gets access to guns that nobody else has ever got access to. I've, I've never cases, heard of some of those exactly. guns. Never even heard of them. So he's great. He is a real asset to bring to the table for like the World War II German small arms. He was a huge asset. So we're planning on using him moving forward, especially to tap into the older stuff and show you where the lineage of various small arms came from. So he's, it's been a real... I thought I was fairly weapon. familiar with all those weapons and I started watching video, just YouTube videos, and he's got stuff there I'd never heard of, oh, absolutely. never even dreamt of. It, it, almost every week he brings out something you never even heard of. Yeah. And with him covering the history, the development, all that, and then you actually putting hands on the weapon and evaluating it, right. you know, like a seasoned trainer and seasoned soldier yeah. that you are, that 
that is a great team. That's the dream team right there. Yeah, because you, you're right. It's hard to get that mix of guys who know the historical aspect, but you don't right. have guys that right. have been. And you're pretty aspect. strong in history. I'm not, yeah. not sliding you there. But it's like some of those guns are sleepers. You can pick them up and shoot them, and you go, oh, my God, this, this gun is softer shooting, or it's more controllable, yeah. or it's more ergonomic than I thought. And then there's many guns that are actually the reverse of that. They look good conceptually, but actually shooting them, you're like, you know, this gun's kind of a dog. Okay. Yeah, that's, yep. that, it's nice to be able to put hands on and go, you know, this may be a gun that looks good on paper, but the fact that some feature of it is, is lacking really kind of kills the gun. And with all that development going on, I mean, they were free to try different routes, trying to get to the same place, and there were winners and losers, and there were contemporaries that shouldn't have been there but were there because of the war anyway. Absolutely. Yeah. So we had the Grand and the Johnson for a while just like we had the P-17 in the 1903 in the First World War for a while. I'm glad you brought up the Johnson because the reality of that is... It's a gun that if you, you know, if you know anything about the history of it, there was a lot of politics involved. Yes. There's a lot of, oh, it's a better gun. It should have been adopted instead of the Garand or Garand, you know, all that kind of stuff. If you shoot the Johnson at all, you know immediately the Garand's a better gun. I mean, immediately. Yeah, there's a few advantages to it in terms of the 10 round capacity, but overall it's a recoil operated gun. It's really not a very good gun. Is it hard to maintain? It's somewhat hard to maintain. It's also a gun you have to have a firm platform behind. If you're not okay. behind the gun solid, okay. the gun will, it won't run. See, it's, it's really not, it's a cool historical fact, but the, the Garand is a, a far better gun. The U.S. made a much better choice. I always, I always thought the M1 was about as GI proof as you could get a gun. I mean, it took a lot of abuse. What's interesting to me is the United States was the only country that really had the capability of fielding a weapon like the M1 Garand on as wide a base as we did. Because when you look at that gun from current point of view, it's an expensive gun to make. Very expensive. Very expensive. With the forgings and all the machining, absolutely, you have to set up a factory and do a cut at this station, move them over, do another cut here, and. and the intricacies of the design. It's a, you know, it's a design that, like many small arms of that era, if there's a few things that aren't right, the gun won't work. Exactly. It's amazing that the United States was able to field that weapon in the in the volume we did and the numbers we did and with the results we had, and we're the only country that could have done that. Evidenced by the fact that really no other major combatant in World War II was able to successfully field in a very large scale a, a semi-automatic battle rifle. No, the G43 really never no, made it. Honestly, it's kind of a dog. It's a nice looking gun. It's cool. Yeah, it's cool. Um, the Takarev, once again, I mean, there's design features of those guns which are neat, but neither one were anywhere near the success on the battlefield or is seen near the, the widespread service that the M1 did. Right. As far as sidearms go, to go back to pistols, if you take the 1911 out of the mix, what would be your pick if you P38. had? P38. Okay. I'm a big P38 guy. The guys that have my World War II, you know, German small arms, Vickers Guide book, know that that's my favorite of all the World War II specific small arms. Obviously a big 1911 guy, but remember it's a gun really that came from the World War I era and was carried over. And obviously, I mean, did a fantastic job in World War II. That's where it really cut its teeth. But if you look at guns that really came to fruition in World War II, handgun wise, yep. it's the P-38. Yep. Yep. I've got a real sentimental spot in my heart for the high power. And a lot of those were carried. Yeah. Uh, by the Nazis. It's interesting, both carried on both sides. Yeah, yeah. You had allies using them, and you also had, had Germans using them. We had uh, both versions, yeah. and that's what I started out, my first centerfire pistol. When I was in the military, that's what I bought, a high power. Because we didn't even have any other Wonder Nines back then. Oh, no, absolutely. There was nothing. And what else is interesting is, it's like everybody gets you know bent out of shape about the small thumb safety. You yep. can't use it and everything. And I understand something. In the, in the military, and same with the 1911, the guns are carried condition three. Yep. Empty chamber, hammer down. Yeah, you bring the gun out, you rack around the chamber, you, you shoot. You know when you're going to use it in the military. That's it. And then the safety's designed to put the gun back on safe to reholster. It's not a gun that was carried condition one, cocked and locked like we do now. Remember, that was a Jeff Cooper Ipsic thing, Ipsic development. That's where that came from. So your guns like the high power in the 1911 were designed condition three and the gun was put them back on safe. You know, once the guy brought the gun out, racked it, engaged the enemy, and then they put it on mechanical safe. So they need to understand that's where those safeties came from.
Last time, uh, last year this time, we got a new service pistol announcement too. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, you probably heard about it before that, but were you surprised? No, I, I the, heard about it at the show. Did you? Yeah, I, at the same time everybody else heard it, okay. that's when I heard about it. Was it a surprise to you? You know, from what I understand, the gun passed the test, the Glock did very well, and it just yeah. came down to cost. And I understand the government's point of view. Hey, we yeah, the Glock's a good pistol, but it's not a hundred million dollars better oh, pistol. Okay. So okay, yeah. I understand that. That was my surprise that the Glock didn't get it, basically. Well, Sig was very aggressive on their pricing. Okay. Extremely aggressive. And you know what? That was smart. If you look at Beretta and the amount of mileage that got Beretta got out of the yep. M9 series and yep. the amount of sales. So pricing that gun very, very aggressive to the US military is a windfall. That was I gotta give Sig kudos for that. That was a smart play. I uh, I went out and bought a, a 320 and I'm I gotta say it's not a bad gun. I like the gun. Um, it's not my favorite design. It's not a high power, but uh, it's not a bad gun to, for an issued gun. I will definitely be getting one of their M17 style guns that they're going to be bringing out. All right. um, I'm going to quiz some of the guys at SIG to find out when those guns come out, but whatever they're going to bring out, if it's a collector set or whatever, uh, because of you know my affinity for military small arms, I'll yes. definitely be getting one of those guns. Don't have one yet. I had a 320, I ended up selling it. It was an okay gun, but there's guns I like much better. Yeah, me too, but I'm, I'm going to personally hold on to mine just play with. One of the M17 flavor guns for sure. Is that going to have anything different as far as trigger pull or anything? I don't or? think so. I think it's going to be as close to the actual U.S. military spec M17 as they can make it. I think so. I hope. Mine has a beautiful trigger pull right out of the box. I haven't changed a thing on it, which is rare for me, a gunsmith. Have that. you had a chance to go around and see anything? Have you seen that new P365 they've done? I have not yet. I tell nope. you. I just went over and filmed a bit. One of our guys shot it yesterday. Yeah, I, I filmed a bit with Phil Strader with it. Very small gun. I was, I was amazed how small it was. They put a lot of thought into it. That gun, I think that gun has real potential. I mean, I like a lot of people. I saw it online, and I'm like, okay, I, we'll wait and see, you know, Mr. Wait and See. But after seeing it here at the show, I think the gun has real potential. I would definitely be looking to check it out. Very compact, slim pistol. I did make it just walking past the SIG booth. They have a beautiful setup this year. Oh, yeah. Just huge. Yeah, they do a so real good job of presenting their products. No matter Very whether nice. you like their stuff Very or not, nice. you have to give them kudos for the way they market and they present their, you know, they, you got to give them kudos for that. And right now, be, being last year, the political times were what they were and everybody felt safe. Suddenly we were awash in these polymer striker fired pistols. Yeah, oh yeah. And more than ever. They're not that bad anymore. There's not that many bad ones like there used to be. No, there's not. I mean just about every major manufacturer has one. And of course, FN, SIG, Glock, HK, right down the line. And you just kind of pick the one that has the best features for you. Yeah. The Glock, without a doubt, is the world standard and it's gonna stay that way. It, it, it that gun has such a head start. And we're talking that, about that was a generation before Absolutely. anybody even came Absolutely. close to cutting it coming That out. will always be the gun that is the yardstick. So if you have if you don't own a Glock 19, I would highly recommend buying one. You can never go wrong owning one, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't try other guns. I'm a big fan of the HK VP9, very accurate pistol. I, I like it a lot. It's one of my favorites, but it doesn't mean I'm going to get rid of all my Glocks and go with that. I would urge everybody, hey, you need to have a Glock. If you don't have one, get a Glock 19 and learn how to use it because that pistol's not going away anytime soon. You're, it's basically the 1911 of present day. You know, the 1911. Glock will not be going away anytime soon. It doesn't matter how many polymer striker fired guns are brought to places like SHOT Show, the Glock is still going to be here, period. Yeah, exactly. Uh, for all the guns I own, I still carry a Glock every day. Uh, it's just simple. It's like carrying a hammer. You know it's going to work every time. Yeah, I'm so. a big fan of Glock. Big fan of the 9 mil, especially the 1917. Right. Big fan of both those. Also a fan of the Glock 20 and 10 mil. It's that's a gun, if a gun you're if you need a gun for backpacking, you're out in critter country. Right. The, the that's a million. lot of firepower in a small package. Yeah, it's it's a gun that I mean brings a lot to the table for, for what it does. I mean, 15 shot, 10 millimeter. So now, I've had a lot of people that are saying they go they're going back to the nine millimeter rather than 40 or 45, and they're just loading federal HSTs in it. Um, after the FBI evaluation and all that, they're all for it. So the nine millimeter seems to make a huge comeback, at least for us. Well, I. Some of you may have seen it on my social media. I put out a 
I put out a blurb which was very controversial. There's people that agreed with me and people that didn't. Sure. But the, the caliber wars are over on 9mm1. Yeah. It's that simple. There, and where did that come from? Well, there's very effective 9mm self-defense ammo in the market. Totally Stuff different world. Very, very proven right. versus the FBI Miami shoot at. And you go back to those, that time frame. You got to remember we have ammunition now. We have ammunition that now has a fantastic track record. Wow. So then you go, okay, if 9mm, 40, 357 SIG, 45 will all get the job done, it makes sense to use the one that holds the most bullets, right. that practice ammo is easiest to get, and also has the less recoil. The right. least recoil. More people can shoot a 9mm than anything else. And you have a wider variety of pistols to choose right. from. So yeah, I, I'm like most guys. I basically become a 9mm guy. I'm going that way too. Uh, you know what's interesting is 9mm 1911s. If you talk like Wilson Combat, half the pistols they build are in 9mm. That's been going on for the last four or five years with the that, people I'm talking about, that been talking to. Them. Yeah. That shocks me. So At Brownells, we've been selling a lot more 9mm barrels and slides. And they, they've really debugged it largely. And you know what? The key there was a reliable magazine. That was the key. Because back in the day, in the 1911, you know, you had Colt and various people that offered, but nobody took them serious. The magazines were an afterthought. The gun was not very reliable. They didn't work with hollow points. They didn't have a ramp barrel. They just, they were an afterthought. Well, that's changed now. And 9mm 1911s now have been very sorted out, largely debugged. The guns run right. like a champ. They'll, right. You'll run ammo that you would normally never think they would run. The magazines work. Ramp barrels now are basically all but universal. So now that's a gun that, and if you've never shot a 9mm 1911, I strongly urge it. Softest shooting, especially in the steel frame. Softest shooting center fire handgun that I know of. I mean, they were very, absolutely very explode. pleasant. Very pleasant. You put many rounds through them, and then you go back to something like a Glock or an M&P or whatever. It's like, oh my God, I'm shooting a 357 Magnum because they are very. They will spoil you. A, a steel frame 9mm 1911 will spoil you. Now, for those of you that don't know, you can actually go to one of Larry's classes and learn how to build a 1911 from the ground up. And that is quite a process. I do that a lot myself, mostly for my gratification. But uh, not everybody can put a 1911 together without, without a lot of help the first time. I've got a class coming up in, down in Austin this summer. And it's a five and a half day class. We start on a Monday, we end at lunch on Saturday. And I'm going to tell you, it's it's serious. It's balls to the wall. Now we don't we don't do any milling. We just don't have time for it in five and a half days. Nope. We lightly touch on hand checkering, but you basically start with a box full of oversized parts, casting sliding frame, cart barrel, whatnot. You start with a box of oversized parts, and then you hand fit those. So by the end of the week, you have a right. functional 1911. Right. The way that works is our goal is to be test firing the guns, hopefully right before lunch on Friday. And the theory behind that is, if something needs to be tweaked, we can tweak it and then hit the range again before close of business on Friday. And then Saturday's a review, and you're kind of touching. You won't get the gun, you know, finished, finished. Then they'll be still polishing. You want to do and There'll some be a lot to left to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the gun's functional. You can sight it in. It's reliable, and then you can kind of go from there in terms of how you want to get it refinished. Anything you want to do beyond that. I usually recommend for the first gun. They build a 45 caliber yeah, simply because the margin of error is so great. I mean, a 45 will run no matter what, just about. Once you get to the smaller calibers, they get a little finicky, yeah. uh, especially with tight tolerances. I, that we do. We, you, know, you can only build a five inch gun. There's some pretty strict parameters. You have to build, basically build a five inch gun, standard barrel and barrel bushing like setup, no full length guide rod, just kind of a standard traditional M1911A1. You have some variety in sights, a little bit of variety in safeties. You got a little bit of a wiggle room there, but the, the basic layout is just kind of that configuration, you know, that GIs carried in World War II. Right, right. And that's once they I get, agree with you. That's the gun they need to learn. Once they get that done in your class, they can go home later on oh, and add the full length guide rod or another safety or something. Yeah, and, or start building a commander or get yeah. into a nine mil or a lightweight yeah. frame or whatever they want. They, they need to learn on the baseline, the right. steel 45 ACP 1911 A1 a configuration right. gun. But you don't just plug in the parts like a Glock or, a, or an AR-15, it just doesn't happen. Nope. These, that slide will not go on that frame until you actually work it down. Exactly, you have to assume that every component, no matter what, 
is going to require to be gunsmith fit. Doesn't necessarily mean hand fitting, but it is going to have to be installed and fit to ensure that it functions properly. When I'm on the tech line and they order a new safety for 1911, I say, you realize that has to be fit, right? No, it's just 1911, they're interchangeable. Well, no, no, not, no, not at all. That, yeah, those parts I, are fitted. My classes, I tell everybody, remember there's three components that you have to assume if you swap them out on a 1911, there's three components you have to assume will have to be fit. Thumb safety, extractor, and grip safety. Those th three do not assume they will drop in and work. Right. Right. Even the same one, if I have a Wilson beaver tail fit or a Wilson thumb safety fit here and now are an extractor and then I drop it in, you, you almost guaranteed you're going to have to fit that part. Well, even the trigger won't drop in. Yeah. You've got to take material off the top and bottom of the shoe. So any 1911 out there, you buy a Springfield, Kimber, Colt, whatever, and you buy a replacement safety from Colt, don't assume it's just going to drop right in. Now, just because the polymer pistols seem to be taking over, the 1911 seems to be going really strong. Well, it's a piece of Americana. It's a piece of American history. Uh, it's like my buddy Ken Ackathorn says, it's, it's like the Colt single action army now, lever action, you know, Winchester. Yes, it is. It's Americana, it's not going anywhere. You still got I'm sure there's a couple of dozen new ones at the show that's, sure. you know, being unveiled right now. But that gun just doesn't die. You know, it's such a good design, it really is. It has a few things going for it. People need to understand that by modern standards, they can be finicky and they can be, they can be very ammo sensitive, they can be magazine sensitive, more so than you know, Glock, Sig, Beretta, HK and whatnot. But what you get in a 1911, they're, they're, they're an easy gun to make very accurate. Yes, they are. Very, yeah, we've, we cracked the code on that a long time ago. So they're an easy gun to make very accurate and also to this day, Amazingly, over 100 years after that gun has been introduced, a tuned 1911 trigger is still the gold standard. Yes, it is. Isn't that amazing? That is. Uh, Unless you cock the hammer on your Colt Python. I mean, nothing else is as smooth. Yeah, you're going to, for an auto loading pistol, no matter who makes the pistol, they still compare their trigger to the 1911. Right. That is still the gold That's standard right. that everybody compares against, which is amazing. That design is held up. And I was thinking the other day, um, you know, why did they go with the SIG when it has no track record where the Glock does? And I said, wait a minute, when they adopted the 1911, it didn't have a record either. Yeah. I never thought of that before, but yeah, it just happened to be a great design. So, well, I say, it, I say like give I the said, SIG a chance. Hard to get around $100 million, too. Yeah, you're looking true. at fielding this pistol versus this pistol, true. and it's going to be a $100 million difference. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's pretty hard to get around. It's a sweet deal. For the Department of Defense. I mean, they can put that money into pay raises, upgrades, benefits, whatever, hospital equipment. What's new going on at Brownells? Retro line. Yeah, I saw uh, that. We've got these, like I used to carry back in the 70s. Um, 19, uh, M16A1 was my issued buddy. And I got a Vietnam bring back. It must have been rebarreled. That thing would hold them all at 200 meters oh, yeah. under, one, under the one disc. Some of the older, it's amazing, some of those older M16A1, it's amazing how accurate. With that 55 grain bullet. Yeah. It was like fan. shooting a varmint rifle. Some of those were fantastic. Of course, I could see a lot better back then yeah, too. I had really good vision back then. Now, question on that, um, since I'm interested in it, you would be selling all components, you're going to be selling complete guns. That's What's the, the plan. plan For the time being, every component's going to be put into rifles, and as we get caught up with demand, we're going to make separate components available. That is the, that's what we're aiming for. Hopefully, we'll have some separate components available by the end of this year. Rifles are supposed to be coming in quantity this spring. So it's all in the works. Paul Levy's done a heck of a job getting this thing corralled and brought to fruition. Good. So it's been a, been a pretty good ride. It's, it's kind of fun to pick up and feel that triangular handguard again. Oh, yeah. And just a nice, simple, clean, no gadget sticking out of it, no Picatinny rails yeah, serrating me. It, it's amazing. Uh, you know, you had all those guns and then everybody rushed to customize them. And then now you've got guys, well, hey, I want to get back to, see, so you have a complete right. reversal. It's the old, what's old, you know. What, Just think how old those, old uh, those four rail handguards look now. They, are. they look like the clunkiest thing in the world. Everybody's streamlined and gone round. Yeah, and, and lock and yeah. Yeah. and all that. Yeah. We've come a long way. So, and, and if you're not into the, the machined aluminum, I mean, Magpul can make anything you want as far as stocks. Who's got a better selection of stocks? 
Jeez. Just that simple CTR stock, that's what I put on a lot because there's nothing there. They're just out of the way. Exactly. And I'm kind of a fan of the KISS principle, keeping it yep. simple. Yep, minimalist on that. If it's something I've got to, you know, be able to use in a hurry or something, or navigate a doorway, a car door, a hatch, you know, for the younger guys that are still serving. Yeah. It's also interesting where now that carbine format gun in 5.56 is now the standard. Yes, it is. You know, a yes, lot of it people is. don't know. They, I mean, ri originally, the full length M16 was still considered a carbine. It was. Mainly because of the caliber. But still, now that 20 inch barrel gun is largely by, gone by the wayside, and now that the shorter barrel carbine. Right. Yeah, when that, when that M16 came out, I mean, the world was shooting 24 and 26 inch barrels in bolt actions a lot, or uh, military guns were much longer. And that was considered, you know, I thought of it as a carbine, but yeah, that's exactly. the battle rifle. Yeah, I know now you look at it and go, well, no, it's a full size 5.6. Yeah, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, I know, dude. So, Tell me about it. A long it. way. We got good magazines from a lot of makers now. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we finished up our magazine contract with the military a while back. Got really good reports from the field on those magazines. You guys are doing a 7.62 mag now, aren't you? Yes, we are. Yep, and it looks like a big version of the of the 5.56. Five, right. Uh, and a, SR, a GI style. SR25. Yes. Interchangeable pattern. Yes, indeed. And uh, they're good magazines. They're really good magazines. We had uh, the military design their own follower for the ones we sold them. Sure, it's the yeah. TAN follower, yeah. which we can't sell to civilians, unfortunately. But I've always had great luck with the green followers. And Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'm interesting is talking to my buddy Ken Hackathorn a while back, and we were discussing how the disposable magazine concept came about. And he, he talked to a number of World War II vets that said, look, one of the things about running the M1 carbine is, like every week, they would basically get new magazines. Okay. And we'd, they understood yeah. the magazine was quasi-disposable, and they would essentially get brand new mags, load them up, and they would carry them for a week, and then they'd get it. And he said there was never a shortage of magazines, There was if there were ammo or the magazines. And he said, frankly, the same with the BAR. The oh, same thing yeah. with the BAR. Yep. Now, with that in mind, because one of the things I'm sure has always puzzled people is why was this M16 magazine back in the day, this aluminum M16 magazine, kind of considered a disposable magazine? And it really was. But you got to remember, Eugene Stoner and the guys, that's the mindset they came from. They came from where M1 carbine and BAR mags were quasi-disposable. Guys could get them at any point in time, right. whatnot. So now they move forward with a you know AR-15 M16 style weapon. So the aluminum magazine, of course, guy's going to use it a couple times and then throw it away. Right. I'm sure they never envisioned that you're going to have guys carrying the same aluminum magazines for months and in cases years. Nope. Nope. Although so, I've got some old Adventure Line magazines from the 70s that still purr right along. And in my theory on that is. You got to understand something. Look at the cost of the magazine. The ratio I always have to like to look is: look at how much the magazine costs versus the ammo that you have shot through the magazine. Right. That's, so that's a good go, way to look at it. Yeah. This magazine, you know, might be nine, ten bucks, whatever. It might be twenty bucks. Okay. I've used this magazine for X number of months. I've shot. 600 or 700 or 800 or a thousand dollars worth of ammo through this magazine for instance come on you got to keep things in perspective at some point you know what it's time for that thing to go away yeah. Yeah. well you're in a position where you see equipment fail what holds up what doesn't what works what doesn't um, you've got a lot of rounds behind you I mean yeah. you, you've seen everything break that can break tell you the number one thing I see problematic and it started when I started this line of work and it continues to this day is people don't lube their guns they don't I don't know what it is they can't get the concept that this gun has to be lubed and there's still need absolutely. even a Glock needs to be a lube yeah, absolutely and there's some guns that are so forgiving of it like Glocks and AKs and whatnot they're so forgiving of lube that people that becomes the norm to them and then they start running guns like ARs, you know, M4s, 1911s. Doesn't other work guns, well. Dude, that have to have lube. Doesn't and work they, well. they don't have the mindset, that, hey, wait a minute, this is a gun that I can't run like a Glock because it's not going to work. That is yep. the number one problem I still see to this day. Yep. Well, a lot of people got out of the habit. The, the guys that grew up with Garands and such, that was like a farm implement. You greased that sucker every yep, time, right. you know, you got ready to use it. 
oil, grease, you made sure that thing was lubricated from one end to the other, just like a steam engine. By God, they'd, they'd purr along no matter what. Well, I, once again, I've been talking to friends about this. We're at a period of time now where enhanced coatings, right. enhanced you know, finishes and whatnot, really kind of replace the need for some lubricant, and that's a good thing because it you is. have to assume the average guy is not going to lube this gun right. So what can we put on this thing that adds lubricity that will help the gun function because the end user is not going to lube it? Right. And that's a, that's a plus because, I mean, that's just been a fairly recent phenomenon, last 10 years or so. Prior to that, it was all the standard finishes. You had parkerizing, you had bluing, you had hard chrome, you had stuff. Right. That, but you didn't have a lot of the newer stuff that has the lubricity built in. Plus, they got smaller rails with less surface area, so there's less drag. Absolutely. So they run like a top. Yeah, the I mean. polymer frame gun's a perfect example. Yeah. You got rails up, you know, rail index points up in front and back, and all in between's clear. That makes a huge difference. A lot of clearance. You know, sand can get out of there, crud can get out of there. Um, you know, I was a slow convert to polymer pistols, but I kept picking up friends Glocks and hitting whatever I sh shot at, and uh, well, I, I just couldn't hold out anymore. Still some guys around like that, but boy, there's not many. Yeah, because I love my 1911s and my high powers and my Smith & Wesson revolvers, but I carry a Glock. You, you can't do any better than that. Excellent, bro. I enjoyed the time here. This was time well spent. It's Thank always you. a pleasure. I, I hope we do this again next year. I'm all for it. If you want to come over to Brown Hill sometime and visit, feel free. We'll Absolutely. be glad to have you. Had a great time. You guys have a good show. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, go to Vickers Tactical website. Take a look at what he's got there and check out Forgotten Weapons and learn some history. We'll see you a little later on with another live broadcast. For now, thanks for watching. Have a good one.